I find myself searching for meaning in this world, in this blind world, groping at it like you're trying to grope some sort of flesh titty, but ah. it's instead a titty of the mind. Mind titty. A mind titty. And, uh, it's, it's, it, or a mind testicle, mm -hmm. groping at all of them. I have to represent all of them. That's what you tend to grope towards, is a titty or a testicle. In school, did you have brains? Did you guys ever brains each other? You know what that is? Oh, uh, like uh, chicken brains? Br well, brains was where you would stick your nutsack out of your uh, zippers and hold it and then say, brains. Yes. Um, no, that never happened in school. That first happened in, in college, actually, and I had never... But yes, I, I've heard that's a thing amongst uh, American locker room uh, buddies yeah. in which they put their testicles on each other. Yeah, they show their testicles and say brains. Yes. Yes. So you, you've been searching for meaning in the mind's testicles. I've been searching for the meaning in the minds of the te in the testicles of the mind, uh, otherwise known as the amygdala. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, the balls of the mind. I've always... I, I've, I, I was always partial to no. Princess Amygdala in uh, Star Prince, Wars. <laughs> she she's, uh, succumbs to her instincts all the time, hmm. which is why she's attracted to little boys. In Star Wars? Oh, right, of course, she is attracted. Well, in Star Wars, yeah, their relationship begins... Um, I mean, uh, we assume that Padme is not horny for the eight-year-old, even though... Yeah. Padme Amygdala. Padme Ad Amygdala. Hmm. Uh... <laughs> anyway, sorry to interrupt. It's a stream of consciousness podcast today, folks. Yeah, it's rainy. It's shitty. It's windy. Oh, no, no, the sun just came out, so I can't even say that anymore. It's windy. It's, but it's uh, a yeah, windy. we're just flowing. It's really flowy today. Flowy like a summer's garb. Mm. So uh, you're searching like for meaning in your uh, in your uh, uh, testicles of the mind, uh, otherwise known as the amygdala. And what have you found? Yeah. Um. I, I've just found nothing but this desire to... Well, I think what I find is... Okay, so I'm thinking a lot about uh, the post-left recently, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. Speaking of, you know, people who are saying, succumb to your amygdala. Mm -hmm. uh, because there is now this very market trend, and it could only happen... So it, it speaks to two things to me. One, uh, leftism has r reached some sort of media threshold we're now like popular leftist uh stuff that have been capitalized on or, or they're now splitting apart from each other creating two distinct movements uh one which is not very concerned with sort of the liberal effect of id poll in leftist thought and the other the post left which is now comprised of people like you know we've talked about them before michael tracy and Glenn Greenwald and people like that yeah. who are now saying that PC is th threatening uh, the factual accuracy of what we do as leftists and so we should strive to eliminate idpol as it is skewing our ability not only to discern reality but also to you know relate to this fictional working class people who I think they think they're I think, like, they're trying to appeal to NASCAR dads in their head or something like that, but I, I don't know what they're thinking. Because there's also, that's also been, like, a fraught discussion recently, is, you know, who is the working class? When you say the working class, what do you mean? Do you mean, like, coal miners? Do you mean, like, people that work in service industries? You know, how broad is that term? Um, do you mean people that who should be, like, economically um, dis predispos predispos predispossessed? to like socialist positions because they're in like a shitty economic situation but they're racist or is it you know everybody who's part of this service class or is it just you know broad enough anyone who doesn't have the power to hire and fire people is a worker or is working class so um yeah debate over these terms has sort of erupted and it's making me very tired <laughs> Because I feel like it's just, you know, isn't the point left unity? Shouldn't we be angry that we are trying to, you know, sow this type of, like, if, like, we're trying to promote a general movement based off of um, you know, the idea that everyone deserves some sort of um, 
dignity, human dignity, and that it's it's good for no, a centralized the, planned economy to exist. I disagree that that is not the point of the left. Never has been. That's <laughs> that is American ideology. What you just said. Uh, that everyone is entitled to dignity. Yeah, that's the American ideology. That um, it's not. It's not leftism. Leftism has always been typified by internecine wars between different subgroups like Bolsheviks and Mensheviks and whatever, just backstabbing each other and trying to take advantage of a situation to come out on mm -hmm. top. Mm -hmm. And I think this is just ex like an example. Like now we have our own Mensheviks and Bolsheviks now, basically. I would say that I think I would. I think there is, you know, a version of leftism, I think, that is um, speci specifically Debs leftism in America that does combine the idea of sort of this liberal human dignity precept that was romanticized by people like the Founding Fathers, but obviously not practiced. Um, and I do think you're right in saying that there is uh, part of the North American ethos as opposed to uh, more European ethos is less deference to authority, or at least that's built into uh, American ideology a lot more, even though Americans do defer to authority a lot of the time. But mm -hmm. yeah, I think ideologically Americans prize that more. So I, I do think the idea that, you know, some people should have more than others uh, can necessarily take root in combination with that sort of individualistic ideology. I, I don't know what I'm saying. I don't know what I'm saying. I, I think mm -hmm. I lost my own point there. Um, but yeah, I, I do think there is, at one point, there was left unity in America, and, uh, and which is what I'm talking about, Deb socialism. Um, and I think we need to get to that point again. Um, but the argument, the splits are, how do we get to left unity? We can't be unified on the left because we disagree about what left unity means. But I guess, you know, you're saying that uh, liberalism has always been better at, you know, unifying more people. Yeah, I think so. I... Explain. Explain yourself. Ex explain. Um, well, liberalism allows for differing ideologies to coexist. I think that's basically the idea. So... Um, and that's where you get unity, which is where we stand alone together, <laughs> you know? Hmm. See, that's the, I mean, that's the weird, that's the weird thing with, um, the post-left people is they're saying that we're losing the people with the differing ideologies, even though they should be economically amenable to leftism because they would greatly benefit from it. Um, because we marshal this intense id pull, you know, a pronoun police sort of thing, uh, we're losing this group of people. But I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's true. I don't know if, like, making social issues uh, a part of a primary campaign necessarily precludes the pitching that campaign to other economically disadvantaged people. But mm. Jesus it's like I, I have no evidence to suggest that just because you are in support of trans people that will turn off the NASCAR dad from Medicare for all you know yeah that's well, the, like the problem with the the post leftists is that yes they do have a point that being too ideological about politically correct things is bad and turns off common people but their position is then, like, they're just the, like, the mirror image of that, where all they talk about is the, is the fact that we're too ideological, and that's their only ideology, which is that they are not politically correct about um, trans rights or racial issues, because it's extremely difficult to actually do any economic work for common people and so you you know it's they're using it as a wedge issue right back so it's that's where i i'm all i share your frustration with them yeah i yeah i think it's like well the thing is who are we appealing to you know yeah that are we trying to 
That doesn't appeal yeah. to the work to common working people either. Being all, it's yeah. all you talk about is how much the other side is crazy. Like, sure, you'll catch, you're going to catch an, a, a a mass of followers for that, but not a critical mm-hmm. mass of people because most people get turned off by this type of conflict and they just want a better life economically and security and stability. And those mm-hmm. things are hard to provide um, with quick fixes that are like uh, sound bites or tweets. To that degree, I really respect, you know, Bernie Sanders, who has yes. always been, he's, he's a fucking politician to his core and will hold his tongue on a lot of issues that he does believe in for the uh for for practical matters you know i do think him supporting biden he does believe in his heart that uh you can probably get more stuff done in a biden presidency for inching the left closer than in a trump presidency which i probably would agree with also maybe if the um Maybe if, like, uh, if the Senate also went, that would be nice, too, but that's probably not going to happen. Well, the Um, president is powerful, and he's right, because the president is powerful, and he'll be able to choose who is heading the EPA and who is heading the FCC and who is heading the transportation. um, I mean, so far it's all, like, feckless neolibs. The the names being floated are guys like Garchetti and, hilariously yeah. enough, um, but the Meg people, Whitman for commerce. The people that are in there now are really, really bad. Like, the people, the person who's heading up the EPA is, like, a, a coal guy. The person yeah. who's heading up the FCC is a former telecom guy. And at, yeah. at least it will be people who are... Mar- they're gonna be more than marginally better, so I, I don't have much. <laughs> yeah. I don't have much patience for the anti, the super hardcore anti Biden stuff, because it's going to be better. I'm very uh, sorry. I'm very sorry. It's but it's just going to be better. I have patience for the anti Biden stuff because I do think the the scenario which they paint where Biden doesn't do shit for four years, and then you create an atmosphere which creates even more backlash to the neoliberal mm. consensus as it did in 2016. I think that's absolutely very possible. Well, I would. And, I hope he doesn't do any... I mean, that's kind of why I'm hoping he really treads pretty lightly with stuff and doesn't do much to avoid a backlash. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, he's, he's not going to do... None of your... No leftist stuff will get accomplished except in, you know, maybe small ways, maybe on a state level. Yeah. Uh, you can see some change. Well, we can't a state pre- or municipal the, level. The but. president can't it can't enact leftist policies. The president is the is the head of the executive branch. He can only execute what Congress decides. So there's to- well, that's the old way, you know. But then Obama executive ordered his way into history, and you know, uh, the, I think well, one of what? the great legacies from pardon with how did he executive his or- order his way into history oh by just doing way more than anybody else like at the time and greatly expanding the power of the executive branch that's been every president since nixon that is true Um, but uh obama is really like when you talk about the president being a powerful role yes it is you know when people say what can the president do they can be a lot there's precedent for the president to be able to you know just unilaterally uh executive order shit into the ground yeah, there is, but the the big changes that we need can only come from Congress. Like, in order uh, to get health care, we had to go through Congress. In order to solve climate change, it's going to have to come through Congress. Um, mm-hmm. Too much of these anti-leftists, I mean, it, it's easy for them to talk about the president because he's a figurehead, but mm-hmm. ultimately he doesn't have as much power as Congress. No, absolutely not. And I think, you know, I I am stupid on like a state and local election race level. And I think, you know, the really the uh, the big push will be getting people to be less involved with the theatrics of federal politics and more interested uh, in the uh, in the goings on of individual municipalities. Yeah. And their relative importance at the federal level. I was seeing that a lot of people 
were filling the only thing they voted for on their ballots was president i saw a, a yeah. journalist oh, say that absolutely yeah which is that's that's just depressing yeah but i think people can't be bothered to have that granular focus on politics because you know every, everyone fucking hates politics and you should it's just more stressed your already shitty life and the only people that have the time to like spend spend a, that have the ability to spend a lot of time on that shit are um you know uh, <laughs> uh, fuckos like us mm. so you know i wouldn't i don't chastise people but the, you know i think even in liberal or leftist media there's i feel like we don't understand that i i don't think that electoralism is terrible just because i think that you absolutely can make it work for you. You can game the fucking system. The Republicans do it every year. Why can't we do it? You know, it's not. It's not that the system is bad. It's just that we're bad at the game. You know, <laughs> you ever think that? <laughs> it's, we just don't have the fucking chutzpah that fucking Mitch McConnell does. We just don't have that. Fuck you. I'm, I'll just do what you. I'll, I'll do what I want with this bullshit system that you gave us. Because, you know, yeah. I know that I'm not smart like Mitch McConnell in the sense that I, I can memorize all the rules to, you know, really granular little municipal local races and just have all that shit in my memory. That's the shit that he does every day, and he's a fucking genius at it. Yeah, I mean, he's uh, a he's a he's a bad man. Yeah, he a needs, smart, bad man. He needs uh, someone needs to Charles Sumner him. <laughs> Uh, uh, but Charles Sumner was a good guy. Yeah, I know, but he's the guy that got. Beat. Yeah, he's the he, guy that got. Uh, caned. Yeah, we need to. You're saying he should get caned. Yes. Yeah, we need the caning of Mitch McConnell. Yes. Joe Biden should come out with his big with his big daddy Dover cane. And was like, hey, listen here, fat. Hey, turtle boy. <laughs> hey, hey, Jack. Come in. Come on, man. Uh, uh, Come on, man! I've got my big old cane. It's like my penis here. I'm gonna knock your um, teeth out. Um, well, or, or how we're bad at it? It's like uh, Lyndon B. Johnson, right? Yeah. Lyndon B. Johnson. Um, I he's pretty in, in terms of like presidential ratings. He's very mixed because Vietnam is on it. But in terms of like getting actual leftist shit done. Like, when, by leftist, I'm using it in the broadest possible sense. But the fact that he enacted, like, Social Security and well, Medicare. He, okay, FDR did Social Security. But oh, you're right, FDR. LBJ did, did, did the Social Civil Security. Rights um, uh, Act. Mm -hmm. which uh, But I, FDR, too. You know, FDR was better at playing that shitty game that was, than it's hard we are to, now. Yeah, that's, it's a little hard to compare. I mean, FDR was... A little crazy with his... Yeah, he, he wanted to be a king. He kind of flouted a lot of norms. But we were also, like, in a way worse time than we are now. So, oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, but, yeah, LBJ is interesting. LBJ, he knew every single senator's strengths and weaknesses. And he was mm. able to get stuff through Senate and Congress because he was sort of an encyclopedia of every member of Congress and could pro make promises to individuals like, if you do this, I'm going to do this for you later because he knew every issue that they needed in their state. Um, yeah. And someone like Obama, who is kind of a wonderkind, wunderkind, who wonder had <laughs> only been in the Senate for two years, didn't really know anybody, come, swoops in, and it starts sort of, um, you know, as you were saying, using threatening to use and indeed using his executive powers with great liberality. They had a a very negative reaction to him. They you, they were of course racist, but they also didn't like him because he's sort of the new kid on the block. And he himself had a major weakness in that he he didn't really know anyone in the Senate or in the House didn't have any relationships to work off to get stuff passed had to sort of ram the obamacare bill down our throats i think it, it was pretty close didn't like someone had to some, like ted kennedy died and then scott brown was holding it up i don't even remember the whole thing um yeah 
So I I think, but to your point, mm -hmm. yeah, that's the thing is it is, it's a game that we're bad at playing, which is why we want the system to change. (laughs) Yeah. Well, Biden might be Uh, good. He's, he is the first democratic president we've had from the Senate in a long time. Clinton was a governor and so, but he was a, you know, for two years, Clinton had a favorable house and Senate and then it's, it flipped on him. So we, if, you know, if these races in Georgia go our way, oh yeah, hopefully they will, because we got, we can apparently just steal elections now, which is awesome. <laughs> Wait, um, what are you talking about? Well, apparently the Democrats have the power to steal elections, which is amazing. I, why didn't we do that in, before? My God. Uh, well, but... Well, the pushback to that is like if the Democrats actually did have the power to steal elections, they would use it in the in, in the most like ham fisted, poorly thought out way possible. Uh, we shouldn't get the Senate because you know that they'll get too suspicious if we get the Senate. You know. <laughs> well, we need to get the Senate, and then we need to uh, do an infrastructure bill. But ho- I'm hoping that even with Republicans in the Senate, Biden can do at least one good domestic spending bill to revitalize the country a little bit that's the one thing i hope for it's not setting my that's what he's got to do reasonable request i don't think it'll happen just pick up all the leaves how about that can we just pick up all the leaves just a bill Uh, to pick up all the leaves there's been a prison labor infrastructure bill which is funny Um, oh god we're gonna make the to, we're gonna make all the inmates do everything. Yeah, we're gonna. That's uh, that's the plan. Um, oh, maybe th- there was one which I was. Um, if Biden executive orders the Dream Act into into uh, law again, that would be pretty cool. Like that's one thing I would. Uh, uh, that's one thing that's being floated around. And you one mean thing for that the I would for the children of immigrants? Yeah, yeah. That be, I mean, anchor I, he, babies. He could do that. I mean, the problem with that is that then. It it really doing it that way makes the other side go nuts, and then they will they'll they'll do better in elections. Yeah, that is true. But you know, uh, you just have to change. You you just have to change the focus away from immigration or anything like that. You have to you have to create a new cultural construct. You have to create a new enemy. Is what I'm saying. Yeah, and we need a new enemy. And it can't be the working class I- uh, immigrant anymore. Me. They're trying to make it the Chinese. They've been trying to for a while. But people really fear that war, so I don't think people want it to be the Chinese. Yeah, we should I do an people... easy war, like Canada. <laughs> We're coming oh, we for would you. kick your ass, buddy. Oh. Come over here, you know. <laughs> oh. Oh, your soldiers boy. will be too busy raping your female soldiers. to. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, we're going to paddle you. That's what we're going to do. Uh, we do that here in Canada, too. Ah. There were big problems at the Royal Military College. I think I clipped a little bit when I said paddle. Sorry. Oh, we'll get, we'll get the bum paddles. That's how we mainly fight war in Canada is with bum paddling. Yeah. Oh, we're going to get, uh, we're going to deploy the uh, the Mounties, which are, what do they ride, bear, grizzly bears? Uh, the Mounties do ride, they ride grizzly bears with big cocks. They Ooh. ride big cock grizzly bears uh, who are just coming at you, and they're just cocks are flopping around spraying grizzly bear cum, which is jet black, and it's ominous. Oh, it's like and it squid steams ink. in the snow, yeah, yeah. like squid ink, and, and you, just see, you just see the steam rising off of it, and it looks like the spirits, it looks like the spirits of all the people that the RCMP have killed, uh, mostly indigenous people. <laughs> hey, have you guys gotten uh, th- any closer to solving that record-breaking shooting that happened, or are you just giving up? Record-breaking shooting? Yeah, the uh, you that mean sh- the one out in Nova Scotia? Yeah. Oh, they. So- I mean, what do you mean solve it? They solved it. They found out who the guy was. Like, uh, what's what's the mystery behind it? Why did he do it? Yeah, why did he do it? Ah, uh, because he's. J- I, I mean, I forget that story. I remember it it being like very involved and there being some like conspiracy e shit to it but i uh i think he was just a pissed off guy i think he was just a pissed mm. off guy uh yeah that's our usually when canada has mass shootings it's uh it's a quebec guy have you so noticed that we haven't had a mass shooting in the pandemic yet 
Interesting. Yeah. R- is that true? Yeah. Has the the pandemic solved mass shootings? Uh, maybe the protests have also solved mass shootings. Uh, I mean, there's been there's been a rise in gun <laughs> violence because the police, I think, pulled back in some, certain cities because they were like, "We're pissed that you guys want us to to that you guys want us to not just shoot people, so we're not gonna care." That's the police. That's an impression of the police. That's the police yeah. talking about. Uh, you see those riots in D.C. from the Proud Boys, and the police are just like, "Oh, those scamps! Yeah, let them go." That, well, there was yeah. there was protesters and anti-protesters. I don't even. They're all fighting. They're all scuffling. One of the. Mm-hmm. Well, I saw one guy, a, a conservative guy, Trump guy, get got pretty good. He got knocked out. So, I mean, yeah, there was stuff in happening. The D.C. ones. Uh yeah, and Andy Ngos posted it and just got knocked the yeah. F but out. you see the full video as the guy started it. He, st- oh, he yeah. kicks down. No, I know. I saw yeah. the whole video. I mean, nobody was yeah. doing. Nobody was comes out looking pretty from the long. <laughs> it's like, it, I know. I'm, I'm. I side firmly with the Antifa guy. Like I'm. I was really happy to see that guy bloody. Uh, made me made me feel good inside. Yeah, I, mean, I know. I'm not going to reach the NASCAR dad. I'm a, I'm alienating the NASCAR oh, dad. No, don't be left. careful. Sorry. I mean, yeah. yes, the correct answer is nobody should be out there in the streets doing street violence. Uh, clearly not great, but it is what it uh, is. I'm I'm generally fine with, uh, I don't know, I usually, every time I've seen it in real life, it is the Antifa kids acting in self-defense. I've never seen a situation where they were the first, it's always a Sunza Odin guy. Maybe it's different in Canada, but it's like I've never seen like the the black block kids show up. I guess they're intimidating to these people, but the sons of Odin guys are usually way beefier than the than the Antifa kids. So well, it's just you'll like, see a, you'll see an Antifa like person try like try to rip a megaphone or an or a American flag out of someone's hands, and it'll escalate. I mean, they do things that'll make it escalate. It's, yeah, but it's, uh, uh, it's not really. I mean, I don't know. I have no need to to defend either side there because they're both. I think they're both out there looking for a fight. That's what they want. I think. So. I mean, Antifa is pretty broad. I think that encompasses the people that are looking for a fight, but also the people who are generally there to um, stop the fascists from doing the worst things possible. What are they going to do? Like, what do they think that I... the Trump guys are going to do when they're doing out there? I'd do some unite the right shit, uh, to, like uh, drive into a person. That was you know, a, um, that was like, like, like there's one, been like that was that was one weirdo. Oh uh, yeah, but there's tons of examples of uh, right wing terrorism in America, uh, uh, okay. and tons yeah. of examples of people getting really hurt. Or also, and also, you know, uh, people against the cops. You can just see endless videos of the cops, you know, beating up journalists and shit like that. And a lot of Antifa people help those people get away. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm in full support. I I do take a side. I will defend a lot of people who identify as Antifa. Not all of them, obviously. It's a broad group of people. Like some people, you're absolutely right, are just looking for a fight. But I don't think they tend to be the lion's share of people that say the of the black block mask people. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I've never been a hundred percent sympathetic with the uh, punching. The punching of Nazis. Oh, uh, I'm fine with that. I don't, I don't think care. you need to. <laughs> you can just. Why is it? Why do you have to punch them? Why don't you just put them in jail? Like uh, they have. Well, that's how you they know do the it. Answer to that. No, no, no. I don't, because that's what they do in Europe. It, it. They just. I mean, we just have this uh, like slavish obedience to. You must. The Nazis must be allowed with fr- freedom of speech. The Nazis must be allowed to say they're Nazis, and then we should punch them. Instead of just saying, if you say Nazi shit, you go to jail. Why don't we do that? Well, that's actually a good intro to this Glenn Greenwald shit that's been popping off lately on this page. Um, it hasn't been popping off that much, but I just found it interesting because it's sort of indicative of his anti id poll. But it is about free speech absolutism, and Glenn Greenwald is a free speech absolutist. I don't know if he. I don't know if he'd say that the punching of the Nazis was okay. Maybe he would be, but he 
uh, is definitely for the old guard ACLU style free speech model, which is, uh, you know, I, I don't agree with what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it, which includes, you know, uh, marshalling lawsuits on behalf of Nazis for their speech being diminished, which the ACLU did and up till recently uh, did all the time. Um, so now, um, there is an ACLU, ACLU lawyer called Chase Strangio, I think. I'm not sure. Strangio. But Chase Strangio. Strangio. Or something like that. I, I don't know. Uh, but they are they work for the ACLU, and they're part of their uh, you know queer discrimination team. And so this book recently by Abigail Schreier mm-hmm. has been making the rounds. Uh, it's called Irreversible Damage. Yeah, I listened, I, to a bit of her, I listened to a bit of her uh, podcast with Joe Rogan. She is stupid. Yeah, she seems... I mean, she has a lot of credentials. She graduated from Oxford and Columbia, went to Yale Law School and shit like that, but... I, uh, this book okay. is clearly part of the anti-trans axe to grind community, and it seems to be uh, just demonstrably biased towards that because the stuff that it's based on is uh, specious at best. So, and uh, what, she presents it as fact. Let me it, now that you've said she went to Oxford. Let me uh, let me rephrase my opinion of her to say she's a rich, stupid person. <laughs> Uh, I think, uh, I think that can, I think that can be seen as accurate, unlike her book. Uh, okay, so this I don't know, is I her, haven't read her fucking book. This is book. her, she I wrote, she wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, the first phrase is, I never thought book banning would be respectable in America. It's like, okay, clearly, yeah, clearly you have not done enough research at all. <laughs> Because it has been respectable in, in America throughout our entire history. Yeah, we banned we banned uh, 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 Huck Finn. We're banning shit all <laughs> a lot the time. Of, yeah, what are you talking about? Uh, uh, Norman Finkelstein can't get a tenure anywhere. Uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> but, our, uh, our he, glorious he, boy, Norman Finkelstein. Norman Finkelstein, you can't buy the Holocaust industry anywhere. But the thing is, Norman Finkelstein knows better than to argue that it's a First Amendment issue, because what are you talking about? The publishers uh, and distributors totally have the right to not publish or distribute anything they don't want to or think will give them unnecessary heat. Right. Well, the a- fuck are you talking about? So Abigail Schreier <laughs> on Joe Rogan said that teen girls are susceptible to becoming trans, much like they're susceptible to demonic possession well yeah and, part of the whole right <laughs> yeah uh what's that what, what was it called the satanic panic yeah and she says that um that the becoming trans is contagious among teen girls and then, yes she calls it a social contagion right so she and then she's always like i, I don't have an axe to grind Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm just worried for our teen girls mm-hmm. who are, they can just go get their breasts chopped off at a moment's <laughs> notice. Yeah, and the stuff, well, what's very interesting is if you just do a bunch of, like, superficial research into, as I have done upon, like, learning this shit. And, you know, I watched the interview with Rogan and I thought nothing of it. Was, oh, this is just, you know, another... Uh, white cis female uh, trans grifter who's like saying to a bunch of uh, to saying to an audience that wants to hear it like these these fucking sickos have gone too far uh, so and you get tons of people like this the, the other one that Rogan has on all the time is Dr. Deborah So Dr. Deborah So is different because she's an actual fucking doctor as opposed to um, Abigail Schreier who's just a journalist and doesn't really have any business uh, offering uh, strong conjecture on medical opinions, <laughs> but uh, the thing with Dr. Deborah So is she uses her credentials to pit uh, gay people against trans people. Mm. That's her whole thing, where she's saying that, and that's also Abigail Schreier's thing too. Is saying a generation of young lesbians are being made to think that they're men, and no, they're not. What are you talking about? How do you know? 
And How can you prove this? Well, she's proving it by, you, by the, the nefarious influence of social media. Ah, uh, yes. Ah, uh, yes. I, I mean, the... <laughs> Instagram made me cut the, my the... dick off. <laughs> Fuck. Now my dick I, is gone. I, I don't know. I don't know any... I'm not... Par- Maybe it's different with Zoomers. Maybe it is like this, where they're all, like, trans-trending. That was the term that... There's trans-trenders, you know, people who are are being trans in order to gain some sort of social clout, which seems very bizarre uh, because I I see people nowadays and I don't think you gain... I still think it's pretty... If you come out as trans in school, you're not going to have a good time, likely. We need, a, we need <laughs> a term for this kind of journalist who pretends to become an expert on something other than reporting the news. Like, it is so frustrating to me how there's these people who have degrees in journalism writing books about anything other than the topic of journalism. What she should stick to is her lane, which is how to report the news. She shouldn't be trying to shape society the way she thinks it should be. And, but she does such an exceptionally bad job at reporting too. Like just and the same with Glenn Greenwald in his fucking article that he wrote about it too. So the evidence that they present that there is this epidemic of trans trending teenage girls is that one in 2016 to 2017, uh, female to male gender confirmation surgery went up f- fourfold. Just in that one year. Oh, no, it's big. What they don't present are any of the years surrounding it, whether this is, you know, a consistent trend or has been for the last time. You know, especially when you have as few gender confirmation surgeries as you do. I think it went from, like, 1,000 to, like, 6,000 in one year or something like uh, like 2,000 to 6,000. I, f- I forget the actual 1,500 to 6,000 or something like that. But that's a pretty relatively small amount of surgery. So why couldn't a big spike just happen in one year for no particular reason? You know, like the, the, it was not longitudinal. Like mm. the, her claim is not based on like a trend that is observable over a number of years because uh, the first. So the other piece of evidence that they cite is this paper that has been, you know, quote, heavy quote marks suppressed by this uh, Brown University assistant professor, Lisa Littman. That's where this all comes from, is this one study which looked at 250 families that were called specifically from websites who were worried about their their daughter's trans identity, you know, (laughs) which, you know, and they interviewed the parents and not the children, you know, so already, you know, tons of flaws and methodology are just present. Um, And you can, you know, I, I just learned this shit from the Wikipedia page. Uh, but it's just even like a very layman's analysis just would make one conclude like you you can't extrapolate a fact from this. You can't say that there is a fucking epidemic of trans trending. You can say that it is something that has occurred in this very discrete scenario that may warrant further study. But what Schreier is doing is like turning this turning the proverbial molehill into a mountain, you know. And as a result, throwing trans people under the bus because it's just, you know, another another thing saying that you aren't who you say you are. You know, if you think you feel this way, then you're wrong. You're probably just influenced by the social media or your shitty friends, you know. So um, I think I think there is a lot um, to say about why this book is on its face. Just total bullshit. But I haven't read it, so you yeah. know. I well, think, I mean, I it's know. it's it seems like it's the aim is to start a panic about girls being having access to testosterone during puberty. Yes, having easy access to testosterone, and with so much of pr- the previous, like, you know, panics. It's it's always been about how you have to have parental responsibility. So where's that now? Why don't they just say if just don't let your if you're concerned about it, why don't you just not let your daughter get take testosterone? Yeah. What it's like do you think there are are like courts across the country emancipating these minors so that they can get gender confirmation surgery? Is I that mean, happening? So, uh, I guess in their minds the teen girls are sneaking out at night. 
they are um, hot wiring their uh, the Model Ts, you know, mm-hmm. in the da- in Dad's garage, hot wiring the Ford mm-hmm. Model T, and driving down to Planned Parenthood and injecting themselves with testosterone and growing chin hair mm-hmm. with all under their parents' noses until one day they wake up and say, "Mom, I'm a dude now." Surprise. <laughs> I'm a dude. Because... I'm just picturing like trans James Dean, you know, going off of Dead Man's Curve after their parents reprimand them. I guess you didn't notice uh, uh, my, my voice deepening and my Adam's apple bulging the past six months when I was secretly taking testosterone because all of my friends said, you know, if all my friends said to jump off a bridge, I would do it. I would do it, mom. Yeah. And now I talk like this. Yeah. And... I mean, teenagers are stupid, but I don't think. I don't. I don't think you. I've never known a teenager to get so hyped up as to get radical surgery. You know, maybe like a tattoo, but not like. I. I don't know. I. I. The okay. The other thing. So also in that stat of plastic surgery from 2016 to 2017, they didn't say what age the people were. Mm. Um, so that stat is also presented as evidence uh, that this is a problem amongst teenagers when there's nothing in that stat to suggest that these transition surgeries are occurring with teenagers as well, which also makes it seem, you know, bullshit on its face. Um, and okay, so back to Glenn Greenwald. So Chase Strangio, Mm -hmm. uh, I'm probably getting that name wrong. No, Uh, that's right. They themselves, yeah, okay. They themselves, uh, are a trans man. Uh, and he said, you know, I'm glad publishers are refusing to carry this book. Right. Because it's a poisonous lie. Um, and Glenn Greenwald said, I am appalled that Chase Strangio, an ACLU lawyer, is is welcoming that this book yeah. is And that's how uh, Glenn Greenwald suppressed. talks. That's how he talks, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's exactly how he talks. <laughs> Look, he, he talks like John Lovitz in The Critic. That's funny. Chase Strangio... Don't hit me in the groin. Chase Strangio kind of looks like Adam from Cometown. <laughs> yes. That's funny. Adam, so Adam from Cometown. That's funny. Uh, <laughs> ACLU lawyer. <laughs> he was like, mad, mad, mad. What does Adam say? He just says affirmative things to Nick's jokes, and then Nick insults him for being useless. Yeah. Uh, and that's well, funny. No, well, Adam just, uh, he just copies people's jokes, like, af- like... Whatever Adam is saying is what someone funny said the week pr- prior, basically. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we love Adam. Yeah. But he's the only one on that show who who probably isn't um, totally mentally fucked up. <laughs> right. No, they talk about it. I mean, uh, Nick and Stav have to go to therapy because um, they need it. But Adam goes to therapy because it's like a cultural event for him. <laughs> that's good i should listen to more come everybody we love come town listen yeah. to come town it's, it's highly highly problematic so highly highly problematic, problematic. highly highly pro- if but you i like also problems, you know <laughs> but yeah that's what that's the other thing is like um come town to some degree uh, is part of they're not leftists, but they're probably as close to what I come to. I think Stav said it on a Chapo show once where he's like, look, I'm not going to read a book. I just don't think homeless people should die, right? Yeah. And he wanted to, like, say he wanted to form the Idiots Caucus of Socialism, which I am. I would love to head that caucus as well. It's just like, I don't think it's like, uh, I don't think it's pitching to people that you shouldn't die uh, just because of who you are, you know. I think that can be powerful. Uh, what did I get off? Yeah, so Chase Strangio. Um, yeah, so so uh, there is this there is this split between apparently a new guard and the old guard at the ACLU, where the old guard are free speech absolutists, and this new guard is like maybe you know things that are tantamount to threats or erasure are not deserving of public protection. I mean, the additionally, how is this a, this isn't a free speech issue because it doesn't have anything to do with a government organization, unless you want to nationalize Amazon, which yes, why not? (laughs) Well, I'm looking on Twitter and at one point, Glenn Greenwald does congratulate Chase Strangio for his defense of Chelsea Manning. 
but let's see. I'm seeing a Glenn, Glenn Greenwald article now posted five hours ago about, ah, the suppression of the book. So, per, so back in September, Greenwald liked Chase Strangio, but something mm -hmm. must have changed in Glenn. Let's take a I look. Think... Let's do a deep dive on this article. A deep dive. <laughs> Deep dive. Deep. Going into, deep. We're getting into Glenn Greenwald's shit pussy. We're getting into mm, his boy clam His here. boy clam. <laughs> boy clam. Yeah. Okay. Well, I do want to save a little time at the end of the episode to go over Peter Turchin. But yes, let's... Let's, let's I, are we going to read this article? Because uh, well, no, this, in this its is entirety... Not, this is on a Glenn Greenwald substack. And I don't want to. It's if it's on Substack, you know the quality is probably low, it's bad quality. low <laughs> to middling because they don't get editors, yeah. and these fuckers can't write without editors. That's something you were gonna yeah. see with Substack. <laughs> it's just hilarious. That's but, why he quit the fucking Intercept because he didn't want to. Yeah. He didn't want to admit. They're trying. I, to edit the me. man who broke. I am Citizen Four. I am Citizen Four. <laughs> I should not be subject to any of your whims or regards. I am King of the Intercept. <laughs> Intercept King. And Li Fong is Duke. Okay, so in the first paragraph of this, is, is he's going over how I was unable to finish an article I had been working on for months. And blah, blah, blah. He's a victim. He's a victim. Let's see. So he's talking about how numerous ACLU staffers told Glenn that the most effective advocate for a more nuanced free speech, nuanced is in scare quotes, nu more nuanced free speech approach was Chase Strangio. Okay. Dr. Strangio. He's not a doctor. No. But it's similar to Dr. Strange. Uh... So what does he go on to say then? He goes on to talk about how Spotify employees are protesting Joe Rogan's podcast, which is funny because they think they yes, have extremely a, funny. they think they have power. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, Joe Rogan's millions of fans are not. <laughs> that's not who we're beholden to. We're beholden to you employees, right? I mean, great. They can just find that. new employees. They can just find. <laughs> I said at first I didn't know how to react, but I'm kind of I'm fine with the employees doing whatever they want because it's funny and yeah I do like seeing the people get really upset about the Spotify employee like who who do they think they are didn't they know Joe Rogan is the man <laughs> uh. yeah I don't understand why people think that like private companies have any sort of responsibility towards. Like, you're, if your entire philosophical outlook is that corporations are evil, then, you know, why do you expect them at all to hold any sort of principled stance on free speech or anything? <laughs> what are you talking about? So Greenwald is going on to say, basically, the thesis of the article is that, quote unquote, it is nothing short of horrifying, but sadly also completely unsurprising to see an ACLU lawyer proclaim his devotion to stopping the circulation of a book because he regards its ideas are wrong and dangerous. Ooh, yeah. I mean... Yeah. Maybe. I think it goes... I mean, the point that they're missing is that the ideas go beyond wrong and dangerous. They, they are, factu one, factually inaccurate. It is mm -hmm. uh, dangerous... It is it is conjecture presented as fact, uh, loosely supported, minimal minimally evidenced conjecture conjecture being presented as fact. Uh, two, which has the effect of demonizing and marginalizing an already marginalized group. It seems so, to me that I don't know. It seems to me that Glenn Greenwald is trying to get somebody fired for his views. <laughs> hmm. How surprising. Uh, I don't know. I think that's a. Uh, I think that's uh, the, the other problem I have, as I've told you before, with Glenn Greenwald doing this is, I still respect the hell out of that dude. Like I, he's he does he continues to do great stuff in the name of fighting the fascist. So I can't say you know 
he's like a right wing grifter now because he's mm. obviously not. I don't. But he's I don't just... know how much respect I have for him. He's he's one of he's one of these journalists as superhero types again. That it's <sighs> just report the news. He is like I. He is like uh, has legal expertise, so I do think uh, I trust him on stuff like that. Uh, and he has expertise in a lot of subjects, but I don't think he has a lot of expertise in endocrinology or uh, psychology or any of this shit, which is why I'm less willing to take him seriously on this this subject. Um, that was a real uh, line in the sand. Uh, drawn and part of you know the the increasing animosity between him and the Intercept editorial staff is that he kept having these sort of ideologically born view that you know PC pronounism was starting to infect the ability of the left to appraise reality accurately, and a lot of the a lot of the stances he took, which. Uh, put him at loggerheads with the editorial staff was about trans stuff because i think glenn greenwald especially as a behavior not to not to to be potentially offensive and to pigeonhole my own demo but gay cis white men are skeptical of trans people sometimes i don't think uh, i don't think suppression makes sense as a tactic in term if you take like behavioral you know, any kind of behavior, wouldn't a behavioral expert say that suppression is not an effective tactic for this? Like, well, you're thinking of the Streisand effect, right? Yeah, sort of. I mean, aren't isn't going to make Where, it cooler? <laughs> uh, I guess so, if you continue to have a debate. But it depends on if it's something is loudly or quietly suppressed. And the idea was to have this quietly suppressed... But uh, that can't happen anymore. So now it's going to sell a billion, billion copies. I mean, it's mm-hmm. also, you know, it's it's what she wants as well. Because, uh, you know, what if Amazon... Uh, so the big news will be Amazon and Target suppress this, right? And she just sells them from her own website, cut out the middleman, and it sells a bunch of copies because there's now a controversy surrounding it. So mm-hmm. it all seems, you know, calculated as part of, as part of a grift. Um, but... Um, yeah, do I? I don't care either way of Am. I, I guess the one thing that you can criticize Chase Strangio for doing is praising Amazon at all, because this isn't a fucking principled stance. Uh, I guess he didn't praise Amazon. He was just glad that uh, shit like this isn't getting distributed by mainstream sources. Which you know, I don't know. Should Mein Kampf right. be? Di- I'm not comparing this book to right. fucking well, Mein Kampf, I think- but. Glenn is um, mistaken in the purpose of the ACLU, which is not to ensure that, you know, all products are equally distributed by the corporations that that do that. You know, yeah. that's not. But I think the push. <laughs> yeah. Does the, the ACLU sue, do they sue Target for anything like does they Do they ever sue big corporations? I thought it was mostly stuff against the government. I think it well in order for it to be free speech it ha- in order for it to be a constitutional issue it has to be against the government right, right? so like that's just uh... but okay so the pushback to that argument is that because we live in a a corporate monopolized world like one or two or three corporations effectively do control the distribution of speech which isn't incorrect you know uh, if you are banned from Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, you know, your speech is diminished. Uh, but, you know, should we, which is why people are like nationalized Twitter. You know, yeah. if there was a government Twitter, then you could sue. Or if there was like a government book distributor, then you could sue. We've but never, there's no the precedent reason- for that in any way, though. We've never had, um, I, I, I would not want to nationalize the social media i think that's a bad plan. no that's a bad plan. i wouldn't want that either but you know what do we do so when corporations do control the mediums of speech and the mediums of thought distribution you know um do they uh, do, should you have increased regulation over them to make sure that uh they allow free speech to be as unfettered as possible i think i i, I don't think you can dismiss that outright uh, yeah. Just from a pure legalism standpoint, you know, we can we can want to say comfortably that, you know, 
uh, well, legally it's like this, so which means it's fine. But we know that's not true. No, I think um, we should regulate. I I think we should regulate speech on some of the on social media. Um, by you know to some degree and we are you know i think there's been supreme court cases saying we can regulate speech like we're able to regulate speech on radio broadcasts and television Mm -hmm. and i think we can could easily apply those same that same framework to twitter and facebook Mm -hmm. but yeah that's i think the other the other part of this debate is how far do we go with dog whistles or um, do dog whistles count as the type of... Because I think everyone more or less agrees that threatening speech, speech that intends to... that purports to harm other people is not protected speech, right? We don't allow people to make threats. It's a crime. Uh, well, so you have to have... It's, it's, that's a, a slightly more complicated. I think you can make a vague threat. Yeah, but I I think we would generally someone someone uh arguing for genocide is not protected speech and we understand why that is not protected speech. It depend I mean it re- you have to in America you have to prove that the person is like going is like not doing saying the stuff theoretically. So someone in yeah. someone in America is able to argue that a genocide is a good idea, conceptually. That, whereas that's different in other countries. Yeah. See, I think that's that's maybe a little fucked up, because if you argue that genocide is a good idea, you know, what are you putting out there? You know, what's going to happen as a result of you distributing that? Is not genocide going to happen as a result of you distributing that? You know, if you advocate for genocide, isn't it tantamount to uttering threats? Well, I don't know. That's I. That's I for think the I would take the moral stance. Yes, that's for the judges. I will. I'm a judge. I will say <laughs> yes. Arguing for genocide is tantamount to uttering threats. I. I think you know, and and such, and so things. When people say 1488, which essentially through through just a series of translations is kill the jews well it has uh, to have a, it has to directly incite to like directly or, in, or be likely to incite or produce action um, i mean in which case ben shapiro should absolutely be tried because he's been named in not one but two mosque shootings so here there's a <laughs> there's a, a supreme court case brandenburg versus ohio where the supreme court unanimously reversed the conviction of a kkk group for advocating violence as a means of accomplishing political reform which is something you've done you've advocated political violence because their statements at a rally did not express an immediate or imminent intent to do violence. So when you do advocate, that's well, that's that's sort of why I think at one point I pushed back on you for advocating any kind of political violence because it is a very slippery slope to genocide. Uh, I would say that. There's a difference between me advocating violence and the KKK advocating violence. Uh, I think the ends to which the violence are are directed are vastly different, and we should be able to appreciate that in context. As I will say before, you know, Antifa doesn't exist without fascists, right? Once they go away, so will Antifa. Um, Antifa doesn't... It, it's sort of like... It's sort of like the argument against Batman. They say that whenever they want to... And obviously Batman is fucked up, so I'm just using it in a discrete example. But there's this one great episode of Batman the Animated Series called Trial, Mm -hmm. where uh, the villains take over Arkham Asylum, they kidnap Batman, and a DA that thinks Batman is problematic uh, because... And the villains force the DA to defend Batman. But they're both going to kill them anyway. It's It's a kangaroo court. But they just like the theater of it. I, I like the way the villains are written in Batman. It's really good. But anyway, the DA over the course of defending Batman discovers that these villains would exist anyway without Batman. Her thesis that Batman is what creates these villains was wrong. The opposite is actually true, is that these people create Batman. Mm. Um, and I think that's sort of 
the line that people like Glenn Greenwald are starting to accept is that Antifa creates fascists when really it's the other way around. Um, and so, which is, yeah, so I, I, I still would defend my use of saying political violence when you're defending uh, the plurality uh, of our liberal society is absolutely justified. I, um, because I, yeah, I, I would only justify political violence with the backing of a something like a constitutional convention or a you know so, a political um, tract. Oh yeah, that makes. I think we can both agree that stochastic violence which we're seeing now today and which Antifa does do, does partake in, which I, you know, makes me uneasy. But yeah, disorganized violence uh, should be amended because I do think that just escalates stuff. But I think, you know, um, we shouldn't shun violence altogether as a means of political ends because, you know, it's been said before that no one has ever gotten their rights by appealing to the better nature of their oppressors. Well, um, I mean, sort of. Sometimes. It's both. I don't know. I, I don't think that's ever really happened. You know, the re the only... I, I sincerely think that the only reason why Gandhi was able to be nonviolent is because that Britain was totally broke after World War II, and it was no longer in their economic interest to have India as a colony. Yeah, um, I, I mean, think that played a much bigger role in the independence of India but than... It's not... Know, that's uh, kind of a simplistic statement, because you're not appealing to their better nature you're appealing to their their greed or avarice or other things in order to convince them you can use the full suite of uh ways of persuasion besides violence you know it's not like i'm gonna try to appeal to your better nature and then i'm gonna if not i'm gonna start shooting it's appeal to all aspects yeah. and you, you you know you can Threaten and coerce in other ways. Um, mm -hmm. Withholding labor is is one of is not a violent act, and that is you know that is used to be the wow. most effective way wow. of getting rights nonviolently. Withholding labor, um, if they come at you like they did the miners in Harlan County, you you should defend yourself. Yeah. But those miners. You know, if they at any point did offensive attacks, I think that was a mistake. But that's, you know, that's that's a big divide among people on the left. I remember that from, oh, yeah. from early in our college days, the divide between people wanting direct action and people not, so. I, well, yeah, I, I think the reason why... And do I think that, you know, a time for organized violence has come yet? Absolutely not. We are very far from that. I still think we can work within the auspices of our political reality to achieve something without the need for bloodshed. But do I think it can become necessary? And is there a chance that in our immediate future we will see the conditions where it becomes necessary? Uh, Absolutely. Well, this I've, is a good, I very much fear that. This is a good moment to bring up Peter Turchin. Who there is, you go. Speaking of apocalyptic here, thought. Right. Did you uh, check him out at all? No, I didn't. Uh, describe him to me, and so, I will give my off-the-cuff Peter Turchin reading. is a historian, although he used to be an entomologist, a studier of bugs. Uh, but he switched fields to history in the 2000s to, to develop something he calls cleodynamics. Cleo being... Cleodynamics? That's very right. funny. Cleo is the muse of history. And in cleodynamics, what he purports to do is to translate verbal theories of history into mathematical models... And then, using those models, he extracts predictions by running them forward in order to find contradictions. And then, that way, he can judge which historical theories are correct and use that to make predictions of the future. It, so he's like, he's found the saber metrics of history, is what you're saying. Yes, and... There's a big article in The Atlantic that came out yesterday or the day before 
basically talking about how he thinks the next 10 years are going to be worse than ever. And he's very pessimistic. Um, he thinks there's going to be uh, potentially a civil war or widespread social unrest. And okay. interestingly enough, in his, in his creation of these mathematical models, he omitted the American Civil War as a sui generis event or a unique outlier. So the only time we actually have a civil, had a civil war, that, he, he took, that doesn't factor in to his mathematical <laughs> model, which I find to be extremely suspect. Um, Wait, why is the American Civil War unique compared to other civil wars? I haven't. Why? I haven't found the answer. I sort of have. Um, let's see. He says it was. It's. Let me see if I. I have his blog open here. I haven't found out why. All the Atlantic article says is that he did do that. But um. That's. But it's because the Civil War doesn't seem that different from any Civil War. Uh, uh, two sides with uh, differing ideological views, you know, uh, also motivated by wanting to access the economic wealth of the view with hmm. the differing ideo ideology, you know, go to go to war over those resources. That's seems to be the most common cause of civil war. So his what are you talking about? His, his view on history is that it is top down. And that the most important that I'm quoting, the most important factor is the divisions at the top with dissident elites mobilizing the masses to advance their political agendas. And this wait, so he's actually saying Soros is he's actually doing the Soros thing. Um, well, sure. Soros. he's either. I mean, he's not naming names. It's either, you know, if you're on the left, it's Soros. If you're on the right, it's the Koch brothers. Um, yeah, but the idea that the idea that um, the left is being marshaled by uh, dissident elites is very funny, because I feel like the, there are no like leftist elites, like in a meaningful sense, or any leftists that meaningfully control any any part of world government, you know, outside of like Bolivia, maybe. Yeah, well, he's not. Ne I mean, he's you know in Connecticut. He's not. I don't think he's hostile. And he's a Russian guy. I don't. I mean, so he he's not he's not hostile to leftism in the same way normal Americans are. I mean, he's an immigrant Russian, so he's hostile to it in like I lived it sort of way. Yeah. Because uh, you know all the ones that come over here are like they got the Solzhenitsyn disease. <laughs> yeah, but I just don't understand who like the dissident opposition to like. The Republicans are, or are Republicans the dissident opposition now? I think the Republicans are the, the dissident elites that he's worried about. Weird, um, weird. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say that. I'd say they're 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 normal. I mean, but it's continue. the it's the ones that are you know, at, um, causing all of this. Basically, the ones that are propagating the lie that the election was stolen. These type of elites on the right are the kind of dissident okay. elites I think he would be talking about. All right. Um, but I find any time you have someone coming around saying that he has discovered ironclad laws of history and is able to use them to predict the future, your, your sensors should start going off that maybe this guy's a charlatan. And, uh, hold on one second. Someone's knocking on my door. Uh oh, it's probably the Canadian Mounties trying to get Alex for for bad thoughts and bad words that we've said. I can hear them entering the the corridor, guns drawn. Well, in in Canada they use water guns. Uh. I'm sorry, I made some extra editing work for you to do because yeah. of this, never, this person. Never pause the recording. Um, I pause the recording. I never pause the recording. So Peter Turchin, Apocalypse Man. Right. Um, let's see. So he's, a, he's issued a rebuttal to the argument, I mean to the article, because he says the article makes him sound like a mad prophet. 
And in the article, they compare him to Hari Seldon of Isaac Asimov's uh, books, The F Foundation. And in, mm -hmm. uh, in Foundation, Hari Seldon is a psycho historian who's able to predict the future using the laws of history. So, <laughs> so oh, kind, of, <laughs> kind of a lot like this guy. But <laughs> a psycho historian, you say? Yeah, um, it's just a psycho historian. It's just, it's just this again. I think also poor journalistic decision making on behalf of the Atlantic, which also they've also been running the most apocalyptic COVID articles too. I really don't want know why I read the Atlantic other than it's fun to feel bad, I guess. The Atlantic is like the ultimate lib paper, the ultimate lib periodical. Well, I, I they, picture they, so. they are self-flagellated. They love to make people feel bad. Like it's just that they're, they're predicting like chaos, destruction, and death. Constantly. That's why they hired Kevin Williamson that one time. Who? Uh, Kevin Williamson is an insane right-wing pundit that The Atlantic hired as a show of good faith to their, you know, uh, oh, we publish all articles of uh, everybody because, you know, we we respect free speech. But Kevin Williamson is a touch more um, extreme than mm. other right-wing pundits, which is why it quickly became a problem. <laughs> uh I, I think once he called for women to be punished for getting abortions, I think that's when he got his ass fired. Uh, <laughs> something right. like that. Well, um, that's basically Peter Turchin. I mean, he's got his own blog um, at peterturchin.com. And if you want to check him out, if you want to find out a, about this guy who thinks he can predict the future by translating, you know, history... history biased history with the words of of fa uh, fallible men mostly some women but as you as we know <laughs> that's a, like that's a, the biggest like number one he's basing this these mathematical predictions primarily on men and their v points of view because that's who's mostly been writing history over the course of history mm-hmm and you, this is a this is a surprisingly uh, feminist take that I uh, fem theory that I didn't expect to hear from you. Well, but uh, as you know, I think women should be the only people allowed in government and work, and that <laughs> there you go. Men should just play video games and bring up the kids. That would be nice. It would That's be a nice. world that I would like to live in. That's the world I'm trying to build. See, that's the world, that's the better world than what Peter Turchin suggests. Well, we should try, we should work towards that world. I mean, he never, he, he said, he's not, he's not like hoping for it. He just says he's predicting it. Um, ah, uh, yeah. Well, I, I kind of feel they're always hoping for it a little. You know, they're, yeah. everyone's always hoping to be proven right, you know. Everyone wants the apocalypse to happen so that they can say, see, I told you. Right. I told you the apocalypse was going to happen. And whenever, I it, feel, you know, whenever it doesn't happen, they're like, well, that's just because it's going to happen yeah. in another 10 years, even worse. Have you heard about how it's going to be even worse in another 10 years? It's like, okay. Mm hmm. It was, uh, I, who was it that predicted, um, was it Nouriel Rubini? He was like a guy that predicted the 2008 financial crisis. Or guys like Peter Schiff also predicted the 2008 financial crisis. But their entire gig had been predicting financial crises. And they just happened to get it right this time. Like their whole their whole, their whole, whole gig was um, every year they would give, ah, this is the bubble this year. But they got the housing bubble. They both got the housing bubble right in 2008. So credit where credit's due, I suppose. But Peter Schiff spins that out into, I am economic genius market man, but he also is very right wing and appears on Joe Rogan a lot. Not a lot, but enough. Yeah. I mean, the Atlantic is, they just need to sell their paper. I think there is something. So the the Atlantic's target audience is libs, right? Sort of rich libs. Yeah. That's who reads the Atlantic, right? And, sure. um... So, what is it about rich libs that makes them want to believe that the apocalypse is happening? I think they're writing to their audience. And I think there is, like, an undercurrent 
I'm not saying that COVID-19 isn't bad, but to turn it into like this apocalyptic event, I feel is like a desire amongst this bourgeois type of people that almost like in Lars von Trier's melancholia, you know, seek to have these beautiful end times for themselves. Yeah. In the same way that, you know, Mike Pence has an apocalyptic evangelical Christian death cult based on the coming of the second coming of Jesus. These people, you know, want to revel in the sort of opulent tragedy of being rich at the end times or something like that. I don't I mean I I think it's it's a it's a social ill in some of these people uh, in their minds. I mean, there, there's an article, I believe, also in The Atlantic about how people in the Midwest, like in Nebraska, where cases of COVID are surging, are sort of having a reaction, a ho-hum reaction, like, well, I don't want to get it, but I'm probably going to get it, so I guess there's not mm. much I can do. And the tone of the article was like, why aren't these people ripping their hair out and flipping out and screaming and crying like because they're because it just shows that you don't know anything about people because that's how a lot of people are going to react when they're told that a disaster is unfolding they're going to approach it with a calm reserve a lot of the time they're going to just be like well if it's a giant global disaster there's nothing i can do yeah, I think that's another thing with rich libs is that they feel like they should have more power than they actually have. And a lot of their stress comes from the fact that they feel so impotent at being able to change these vast things that they believe in, like climate change, especially through their rich lib means of like carbon taxes and shit like that. That And that impotence, you know, translates to this constant, you know, rage they're having. The only at it people, seems at like people like that described in the article. The only way we can get the things done that we want done is by writing articles that make a majority of poor people feel bad about themselves. No. Yeah. That's the harangue. We, yeah. yeah, the haranguing strategy. I guess that's where we would both agree with some of the statements made by the post left uh, where, yeah, the haranguing nature of leftist discourse seems to be a turnoff to a lot of people uh and but i do think people have made various strides in that i think you know you can absolutely point to someone like contrapoints who's uh whose sort of self-deprecating strategy has netted a lot of conversions for people that would have otherwise gone down an alt-right the post left don't like contrapoints they've outed her as a lib now yeah, they think she's a lib. It's, I think I think it's because one, the post left are made by people that have never successfully told a joke. Yeah, and <laughs> two, um, yeah, they think that. I mean, I guess contrapoints did express some lib stuff in that she thinks that uh, she had that whole thing of J- vote for Joe Biden, and like people were very turned off by that and saying she's officially drank the Kool Aid. Uh, but to me, that it's such a no-brainer because it's like you get to choose your enemy. Why would you not choose the easier enemy? I don't understand. I mean, this yeah. election is not the time to tell everyone that we have to make a stand against the Democrats to have a more progressive person there. It's yeah. just the time for that was frankly Obama Romney. Yes. Or well, Obama yeah. Romney can't happen because Obama's, you know, the sitting president. The time for that was 2008. But yeah. but then that time was bad too because of Bush and, you know, but yeah. all, like who was the alternative to Obama really? It was we had Hillary Clinton and John Edwards, I think. <laughs> well, not him. He he well, fucked his way out no, of No, but job. at the time he that hadn't come out yet. Had that not come? Oh, no, man, that, that guy is did su- such comically horrible shit. That's so funny. Didn't yeah, he no, cheat I on like, his wife who was dying of cancer? Yeah, I, I like John Edwards. Uh, he's a badass. Um, he, he went <laughs> to a, He performed well in a debate the, like, day after his aide was like, listen, I am not going to pretend to be the father of your baby. Or I think it was not at the day. I think it was an hour after his aide gave him an ultimatum that he had to come clean. John Edwards went out and performed well in debate. So, like, he would have made a really good president, I think. <laughs> if he can handle that. He can handle, <laughs> he can handle being basically blackmailed by an aide over the fact that he fathered an illegitimate baby. 
Uh, and then, I mean, yeah, he could have looked Putin. He could have fixed Putin up. <laughs> That's what you wanted, a president. Yeah. Uh, I want, I know all of my, I judge my presidents by the amount of, oh, I, I also just love the phrase illegitimate children. Uh, these babies don't count. No, they don't count. What <laughs> are they, they can't, yeah, inher- yeah. they can't inherit anything. <laughs> yeah, the bastards. Yeah. They can't get any tracts of land. They'll have no claim. We should discard them. You have no yeah. claim. <laughs> I'm sorry, son. You have no claim. <laughs> son, it's time I gave you the talk. You have no claim. <laughs> uh, yeah, so... But yeah, and I do think there has been a successful mainstream version of leftism... Um version of leftism i don't think you know it, it's it's very far away from you know what people are trying to do with universal housing and universal health care and a bunch of universal other things that we would deem to be needs but um i i do see some progress with it and i do see some progress in the fact that dsa membership has exploded and i do see some progress with the fact that Guys like Andrew Yang, who should be these bloodless tech bros, are supporting UBI and actually learning, you know, how to craft better versions of it. I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm not saying I'm optimistic, but I'm just saying I don't understand what the post left is rebelling against. I think uh, I think, you know, a lot of mainstream leftist discourse has been successful in in marshalling support from people. I guess, you know, they're referring to riots a lot of the time. Like that was Michael Tracy's beat, mm-hmm. which was saying that BLM riots are fucking destroying unity but i i don't know i don't know man because i think the people who are winning over the idea is the people that we have to win over are the nascar dads way when really the people who we have to win over are libs right like like they're far the libs are going to be far easier to convince to you know do all the stuff we want than the nascar dads so i don't understand like why the idea of alienating those people is so offensive to the post left uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think they are not serious about um, actually changing things because uh, cause it's, it's too hard. It's too hard, so they, they, they go with the easy route. Yeah. Um, change is slow. Yeah, the easy it, route is just uh, criticizing people who you know won't go hard on you because yeah. they're part of the same faction. I mean, they're they're like, and they're also they have their own uh, uh, like apop- apocalyptic tendencies. Um, like, if you listen to what the post left has to say, it's like Biden's gonna he's gonna destroy everything. It's like, really? Mm-hmm. Is he really? Is are things can, really can, that bad? I think we can agree on this um, as just sort of a general guiding philosophy that I think people should have in the future is anti-apocalyptic thinking. Yeah. Assume that the world is not going to end soon. Assume that we have the power to make the world not end. That should be your assumption, your base assumption. The world can't because, end. Uh, I mean, it has, yeah. it's like, uh, if, if we can go through a time period where a third of humans die, then we can go through that again. And that might just be what happens. Maybe we'll have something yeah. where a third of all the humans die. Yeah. Um, maybe maybe it'll be more in the ice age. Yeah. Humanity dwindled to ten thousand people. Yeah. Maybe maybe we'll only have five dudes and five girls left. And then yeah. oh no, the five girls are teens and they're trans. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. They all, oh nuts! They all, and they all want to transition all, too. They've all been talking together, oh, and they, no. they all want to be dudes. You oh no! Don't do it. No, the the fate of that's kind of what they're. That's like the fate of humanity lies <laughs> in what we do next. And Chase Strangio is okay with condemning the human race to oblivion. What are you going to do about it? Well, I'm not. Uh, dang, man. I'm not going to donate to the ACLU. I guess. Dang. Uh, I still support the ACLU. I think even though they did defend Nazi speech, they're uh, they're an in organization integral to some of the best legal cases in America. Uh, some of the best precedent that was ever passed is because of them. So, also, also the other thing is like discarding people outright just because they have some problematic views. I think is something we can agree we shouldn't stop. 
we should stop doing as well. Yeah, which includes for Glenn. Glenn. Except for Glenn Greenwald. Oh, uh, no, nah, fuck Glenn Greenwald. Oh, fuck wait. everything Glenn has ever done. Yeah, yeah. That's what I, <laughs> no, no, that's Glenn, what I like. Glenn Greenwald is all right. No, no, no. Just, I like to... Uh, give, give me that sweet uh, total rejection. Total rejection. Yeah, you brother. said a thing wrong, or several things wrong, so now you are dead to me. Yeah. You are you are dad to me. Glenn Greenwald, just be my dad. <laughs> if you wanna if you want someone to adopt you, you should ask Matt Gates. Oh, you're right. Yeah. I can be the new Nestor. Did you see Matt Gates with uh, Tiffany Trump? No. He uh yeah, Matt Gates like simped for Tiffany Trump on Instagram and then the next day they were they had a dinner together. And everyone was like, ooh, <laughs> Nestor's going to be angry. Nestor's going to be jealous. <laughs> Trouble in paradise. Yeah. Uh, I don't think Matt Gates and Nestor are fucking. What, you don't think his don't hot think son so. and him are getting down and dirty up in their buttholes? Uh, that reminds me of an old 4chan comic that was very <laughs> distributed, which featured a, a son on father incest oh yeah and i remember that it one was deeply it made me deeply uncomfortable i remember that one <laughs> with the blot the it's where the the habibit comes from yeah habibit that's where itty bitty bodie habibit yeah. comes itty from. bitty boat yeah. <laughs> itty oh bitty that's baby. a meme i, <laughs> I haven't baby. thought of in a long time itty bitty baby itty uh, bitty boat oh man 4chan was so good why did it have to turn into nazis oh uh, well they were always nazis it was nazis all the yeah. way down yeah it's Nazis all the way down. Uh, just be the pressurable young Jewish kid. Man, we're making a lot of Holocaust jokes because we're all Jews, right, fellas? <laughs> yeah. Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, we're nearing up on the usual 90-minute mark. Uh, I've got nothing to plug. Oh, uh, to plug. Except for, yeah. We never do plugs. What do I want to plug? What? No, but some maybe we can do plugs for our own stuff if we have projects that are coming out. Uh, no, nothing. How are you feeling, Steve? Lead us off with a, with a, your thoughts on the world, Stephen. My thoughts on the world? The whole world is like a funeral procession. And we should celebrate like the Italians do. With music and dancing and spaghetti. And <laughs> tomato sauce. And then when you laugh, the tomato sauce and the onions go in your nose and you get the tomato sauce onions stuck in your nasal cavities and it really hurts and then you drink wine until you black out and puke 